Okay, so uh, good afternoon all and uh, welcome back after the siesta. So the uh, title of the session is Oncology, is it real uh, or a mimic? I would like to invite uh, my uh, moderators, uh, or, sorry, myself, I am the moderator and <laughs> sorry, yeah. So uh, my panelists, uh, Dr. Santosh Unavar, he would join in some time, he has just arrived. Uh, uh, Dr. Mahesh P. Shanmugam, my uh, head of the department from Shankara Hospital, and uh, Dr. Lingam Gopal, teachers of the, my teacher, uh, Dr. Sunil Ganekal. <laughs> yeah, so Dr. Sunil is not coming, and uh, Dr. Sunil from uh, uh, Shankar Nitralaya, and uh, there is a virtual faculty who would be joining us, Dr. Hani Hamza. Zoom link, Zoom link. And the first presentation, there is a little change in the order. First presentation is by Dr. Mohit, uh, pigmented lesion of the retina and choroid, CHRRPE, CHRPE, and melanocytoma. Mohit? Mike, Mike. Yes, Green. Thank you, Devyank, and thank you to uh, the entire team at BRFI for the opportunity. I think I have five minutes and basically three things to cover, so it's not going to be anything long. I'm going to show images of uh, you know, each with uh, characteristic uh, imaging um, features and, uh, you know, what to expect. Um, and I, I, I apologize, it should be sec the second R in the second of those. And, uh, yeah. So, you know, we start off with the combined hematoma of the retina and retinal pig retin pigment epithelium. I think most of the audience here knows what that is. We started with demography or epidemiology, it looks something like that, the peripapillary one at least. And it's a hematoma, so it can, it can have. Uh, should have three, uh, you know, different kind of uh, components, have an epiretinal component, have a vascular component, the RPE changes, it might be atrophic, dystrophic, or, you know, just uh, overall uh, RPE proliferation. You may or may not have all components in the same uh, eye. This patient does. There's a difference between peripapillary and macular, uh, you know, location of these. The ones in the, <clears throat> the ones in the peripapillary, uh, in the peripapillary area tend to have uh, poorer prognosis, poorer vision, more full thickness retinal involvement and more widespread retinal pigment epithelial abnormality as compared to the macular counterparts. And uh, I think it's important because, you know, this is probably, you know, majorly out of India. The other one also from the RP center in which they looked at, uh, you might not necessarily always have full thickness retinal involvement. You can just have inner retina involvement in which it's seen very well on OCT. And in fact, in their theories, um, they are up to about 75%, they have the omega signs, they not seen it. But the omega sign basically is that the outer retina outside the outer plexiform there is absolutely normal. The easy IZ, the photoreceptors, and the and the and, and the and the retinal tissue inside of the inner to the OPL is actually thrown into holes like that, the Greek letter omega, and hence that sign. So you might not have full thickness retinal involvement. That's what the angiogram shows you. Uh, you know, uh, it'll, this kind of helps you to uh, you know prognosticate if you want to. Uh, you might have the autocadian, you might want to, you know, get the epiretinal membrane off. It also highlights the vascular component of this. And the so-called pedigree pattern seen very well in the middle image in the first, uh, the early, uh, the, 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 the AV phase, uh, which is well described on the FFA flash octa is very, very characteristic as seen here. But again, the angio is not absolutely a must. It may help you pick up some of the complications, right? You must, so epiretinal membrane, apart from, you know, amblyopia, squint and all of those, but for uh, retinal complication, you know, epiretinal membrane, which for the most part does not require intervention. You can have a fraud in your membrane forming at the edge. <clears throat> Sorry, you might have retinoschisis, which is actually on, to, you know, on top of that membrane. And this patient actually had a macular hole, which developed within that. And that you might also, uh, you know, uh, uh, very, very uh, rarely but go on to progress to actually have a retinal detachment. Uh, optic distant nanocytoma. So I, I, I knew this was retina and choroid. Um, I had a very good case of, uh, you know, the, the, uh, a CD body large melanocytoma, but I'm just going to talk to you, talk to you one slide on the most commonest side of the melanocytoma, which is the optic disc. Looks very similar to, looks exactly like the, the top left image. Uh, generally requires no intervention, uh, very low risk for, risk for malignant potential, and, uh, but it can have complications. It can be vascular occlusions like the top right. It can have branch retinal artery occlusion there. Uh, bottom left, it, it can have an uh, anterior ischemic optic neuropathy, or it can rarely, you know, grow inside, infiltrate the surrounding retina, uh, you know, uh, and the choroid, and actually have a conversion to a malignant 
<clears throat> sorry, a malignant melanoma, which is, you know, when you want to treat it, but uh, otherwise follow it and do fields and, you know, higher risk of vascular occlusions. And the third and the last of these is the congenital hypertrophy of the retinal congenital hypertrophy of the retinal pigment epithelium. Um, and again, uh, it can either be single, as most of us know, that's a, that's a pretty big blown up picture of a single, um, you know, uh, patch of a CHRPE. They have lacuna and they, they, they you know, they have lacunae, they have scalloped, well-defined margins, they are flat. And as the, and generally as the Asians progress, they tend to lose pigment and tend to become more atrophic looking. And they can be, uh, you know, uh, they can be smaller, but arranged in groups of up to 20, 30, when they, when they resemble beer tracks because they'll be like paws of beer, you know, all around. And uh, the least common, but the most sinister of them are the atypical ones in which they can be, again, smaller than your regular, you know, smaller than the ones you see here, generally will be all over the funders and can be all sizes and shapes, the comet shaped, fish tail, the fish tail uh, shaped and all. And the issue is that they are associated with uh, renocarcinoma of the colon. And uh, this is just the last slide showing the imaging features of an atrophic, uh, you know, uh, loss all its pigment of an atrophic uh, uh, turkey lesion. It's, it's hypoautofluorescent on uh, the fundus autofluorescence. It shows complete reversal of the pattern on fluorescein angiogram. And the OCT is, unless you look very, very closely, is essentially unremarkable, but just shows how loss of the EZIZ in that area and hypertransmission in the area in which there is, uh, which is outside at the junction, um, which is more easy to conclude. Sorry. Sorry. Thanks, thanks, Joe. So, uh, it's a very nice presentation, Joe. Uh, uh, some questions which we need to discuss. Uh, uh, Dr. Hani Hamza is also with us from Egypt. He is uh, connected to us by Zoom. Uh, so, welcome, Dr. Hani. Yes, my pleasure. And uh, it's my honor to be with the uh, distinguished panelists and the uh, speakers. Thank you very much for the invitation. So, the question goes that uh, how would we differentiate a grade? or a grade 4 ERM that is either an IFIL gone in a state where there is a wrinkling of the inner retina versus the chirpy lesion. What do you uh, comment, Dr. Hani, for that? Uh, again, can you repeat the question, please? So how do you differentiate a case of a grade 4 ERM or yes. a very advanced ERM where the inner retina is convoluted versus a case of a chirpy congenital uh, hypertrophy of retinal pigment epithelium and RPE. Well, I mean, congenital hypertrophy of the retina pigment epithelium is quite a distinct entity. I mean, you can identify it very easily with the sharply so, demarcated edges and the lacunae. And uh, what I would like also to say, maybe you would like to ask about the combined hematoma. Combined hematoma, yeah. It's, yes, it's, yeah. Combined hematoma. So this goes more with the theme. I think in both of them, I mean, the age, first of all, is very important. Lack of history of trauma, so it's not a traumatic epilepsy in the brain. And in both of them, you will find this organization of all retinal layers. So, uh, and the extension of this, I mean, usually they are juxtapapillary and they extend from the optic disc to the macular area. I totally agree with the speaker that the uh, surgical removal of these membranes has a very poor prognosis because of the very deep amblyopia and the completely disorganized uh, retinal layers. So this is my answer to the question. Sure. Uh, thank you. So the uh, next question uh, is uh, uh, to LG, sir, that what would be the surgical tips to manage a case of a combined hematoma? And what would be the tips that when these cases would require surgery, according to your experience? <clears throat> if the membrane is if the whole lesion is right over the fovea, it's very unlikely that you will benefit by surgery. But if the membrane extension is going to the fovea or the fovea is dragged to one side, then removing the membrane at least to the extent possible can relieve the traction on the fovea. It can translate into some improvement in vision. I have had at least two or three patients where there's a one-line improvement. Whether the patient perceived the improvement, I cannot say, but at least you can demonstrate the improvement, provided fovea is not, lesion is not sitting on the macula, which is dragging the macula. Then again, you are very cautious in peeling of the membrane, not like regular ERM, but you, you peel it as much as it allows you to conveniently and comfortably peel without unnecessary damage in the retina. So, the, yes, sir. 
at one point you may see the membrane going in into the retina so that you cannot feel so you have to identify that and probably segment it with scissors and leave it in place so a further follow up question to subhaneshri madam that yes sir doctor yes sir please go ahead yes uh, i would just would like to add the uh, cases of shirky that we have mentioned a while ago as well that not all cases are pigmented, even the multiple ones that uh, bear tags. You may have the white tags, or what we call the polar bear tags. So in these cases, also you have to do a colonoscopy, of course, in all cases, because of the risk of colon cancer. So this is uh, one point I would like to add. And another lesion that we may not have mentioned in our talk is RPE adenoma, or RPE adenocarcinoma. In these cases we have seen three or four cases over the past few years, and they are distinguished from melanomas by the presence of heart accidents around the lesion and the derby head appearance of ultrasonography. It's different from the conventional melanoma. So, uh, thank you. Thank you for the comments for that, sir. So, madam, what would be uh, your indications in a case of a combined hematoma which you want to operate? And would you want to consider a complete vitrectomy or can you do away with a non-vitrectomy also or just peeling the membrane? What would be your take on that? For me, the indication for the surgery would be the age of the patient. So if the age of the patient is going to be an early individual and I'm seeing at that point in time, I would definitely not take that patient for surgery because we know combined hematomas don't develop so late in life. Number two, if the patient is going to have communications inside and a disorganization of the retina, which is going to be uh, the inner retina layers are near complete, I wouldn't definitely operate the patient. And like what Dr. L. Z. said, if the location of the lesion is going to be at the fovea or if the patient has had secondary complications like coronal neovascular membrane, I would definitely not touch it. If it is going to be a simple epiretinal membrane with no much vascular involvement, and not much involvement of the RPE, the pigmentation, that again takes care. And if the photoreceptors are very good, only then I would take up the case if it is a peripapillary lesion or it is located extra phobic. That would be my indication for operating on a combined Thank market. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mohit. Uh, yeah. I would request Dr. Kalpita if she can take up the presentation. The next one, Dr. Kalpita. So just to summarize, uh, doc, Dr. Hani, you want to add something more? Okay. Uh, no, I guess uh, this is all for this uh, talk. It's a very nice talk and very comprehensive. We can move to the next one. Thank you. Thank one comment. So malnocytoma, people can get a, a, a mystic malnocytoma for a malnoma, but sometimes what happens is there's a peripapillary giant choroidal nevus. Along with that, you see a dark pigment deletion over the optic nerve. So we should not look only at the optic nerve, we should look at the peripapillary region also. We may have this like slightly pigmented lesion with brucin extending as a, as a segment, which would be a giant uh, uh, coronal nevus. So when you see a giant coronal nevus, the lesion which you see at the optic nerve is unlikely to be a melanocytoma, though it may look darkish in color, but subsequently it will grow into a melanoma. That's something which we need to uh, think, uh, like keep it in mind. Just wanted to quickly comment on the natural history of chirp. It can actually evolve into uh, retinal pigment epithelial adenoma and adenocarcinoma it can grow bigger it can grow smaller so there are a lot of changes that can happen in hrp and it can currently be considered as a precursor lesion for rp adenoma and adenocarcinoma. Uh, if i may yeah, have okay. just one last comment please sure. for melanocytomas i mean one of the distinguishing features is the feathery edge around the optic disc and also the face it's more common and much more common in dark face we see it in our regions much more and i have seen cases of melanocytomas complicated by c and v and they vascular occlusion as you can say thank you sure thank you uh, yeah dr kalpita you can uh, take over the presentation is about the car and mar dilemma and the diagnosis good afternoon everyone and also i'd like to thank dr divan and the rsc team for this opportunity Today I'm going to talk about the carcinoma associated with sympathy and melanoma associated with sympathy, dilemma and diagnosis. I'll start off with few cases. So my first case, a 69-year-old lady presented to us with painless diminution of vision in the left eye for three months. It was associated with lynx photoma. She underwent cataract surgery with no improvement, treated elsewhere as posterior uveitis. Fundus showed media haze with multiple vitreous floaters and RP alterations were noted at the fovea. 
vision was significantly less in both eyes 660. OCT showed a deployed loss, loss, uh, zone loss in paraphobial area. Angiogram showed uh, patchy hyperfluorescence in the right eye. And left eye showed uh, patchy hyperfluorescence as well as a frank disc leak in the left, left phase. So in presence of acute outer layer diffuse retinal degenerative changes and with no clinical signs of inflammation and angiography showed a breach in the blood retinal barrier, in presence of a ring scotoma, a provisional diagnosis of autoimmune retinopathy was made. And uh, PET scan uh, showed primary endometrial carcinoma with positive lymphomes. My second case, a 34-year-old female complained of flashes and floaters and diminution of visual in both eyes. It was also associated with visual field constriction. Fundus examination showed whitish granular patchy RP alterations in the peripapillary and mid-peripheral fundus. Autofluorescence showed hypo-autofluorescent of these lesions. And the, even the macular OCT was normal, we could see some ellipsoid zone loss in the corresponding areas in the nasal peripapillary region. ERG showed reduced and delayed photopic and photopic responses, suggestive of phone dysfunction. Visual field showed a classical ring photoma. Systemic investigations were normal. So in this patient also, we investigated for autoimmune retinopathy. Fiber PET scan was negative, but serology for anti-retinal antibody came positive. My third case, a 41-year-old male complained of black halos around letters while reading from the right eye. He had some issues with dark adaptation also. But incidentally, he was diagnosed a case of papillary carcinoma at the same time, and he complained of the visual symptoms started in the similar time. OCT was grossly normal. Uh, uh, visual field showed a central scotoma, but ERG showed a uh, uh, characteristics reduced B wave, suggestive of an electrodegative ERG. And when this patient was evaluated for autoimmune markers, he was positive for Z4 antibody, which is a paraneoplastic marker for lung cell carcinoma. So, when an adult with rapidly progressive bilateral unexplained vision loss with no, relatively normal appear, fundus appears and shows a characteristic ERG function of uh, findings of rod and cone dystrophy, uh, presence of circulating autoantibodies in a retinal antigen uh, points towards the diagnosis of paraneoplastic retinopathy. And in all those cases, we want a systemic survey for malignancy. So, paraneoplastic retinopathy is a subset of autoimmune retinopathy, and CAR and MAR are the variants of paraneoplastic retinopathy in a uh, setting of underlying malignancy. So, CAR is most commonly seen in association with small cell lung carcinoma, with autoantibodies against tumor antigen cross react with retinal proteins leading to photoreceptor dis uh, dysfunction. Visual symptoms usually precede the diagnosis of malignancy in majority of cases. They come with positive uh, uh, visual phenomenon. It affects both rods and cones, and a triad of photosensitivity, ring scotoma, and attenuated retinal arterial caliber is highly suggestive of diagnosis of CAR. Various autoantibodies have been uh, implicated in the pathogenesis, most common being recovery and alpha analysis. But it has been seen that around 65% of patients with pioneoplastic retinopathy has no detectable serum have detectable serum antibodies. So 35% may not have it antibodies. In contrast, melanoma-associated retinopathy usually presents years after primary diagnosis of melanoma, and it is most commonly associated with cutaneous melanoma and it is in metastatic state. Most common symptoms being nyctalopia and fundus is grossly normal with uh, normal visual acuity and color vision. However, the ERT is quite characteristic, so it shows a marked reduced B wave with a preserved A wave that is an electronegative ERT. And antibodies are directed against particularly the on bipolar cell pathway, so it shows a on bipolar cell dysfunction. Anti rod bipolar antibodies has been seen. So, coming to differential, there are various other simulating conditions which can look like CAR or MAR, most common being retinitis pigmentosa, non neoplastic autoimmune retinopathy, and various other forms of optic neuropathies. So, uh, these symptoms of day or night blindness, positive visual phenomenon, prolonged dark adaptation, brings photoma, all point towards a diagnosis of retinal disorder. And if it can be proved with a electrophysiological study, actually we don't need any additional neurodiagnostic test. So in a setting of malignancy with unexplained visual loss, we should rule out the CNS metastasis also. This is not a metastatic disease, and this is a paraneoplastic disease. So we also have to differentiate this with a hereditary photoreceptor degeneration because they are usually insidious and slow progression. Toxic retinopathy should also be ruled out. So coming to prognosis, the prognosis is not very good. If untreated, they can progress to severe uh, loss of vision, often to no light perception, and initial initiation of therapy is important. 
So to conclude, paraneoplastic retinopathy are rare diseases that can be easily overlooked when the clinical examination is apparently normal. Visual symptoms can be the first manifestation of a new or recurrent systemic malignancy. Diagnosis is confirmed by an presence of antiretinal antibodies and changes on ERG. And long-term follow-up is needed for any evolving malignancy in absence of a positive history. And treatment may not be effective in restoring vision, probably due to irreversible proprioceptor dysfunction. Thank you. So, uh, thank you. And very beautiful cases and uh, representation and documentation which we could see. So, the points of discussion which uh, the audience would want to know is what would be the key points to differentiate a Karmar or a paraneoplastic syndrome versus an AIR? So, the first question goes to uh, Mahesh sir, whether you want to comment on. So, if you see a patient, how what should I look for or what would be the red flags that I need to think about that I need to think not about a dystrophy or a degeneration, but to a paraneoplastic kind of a it's the age group and the sudden onset of symptoms. Usually they present with onset like late onset nyctalopia or late onset sudden loss of vision is when you would suspect that the patient may have a paraneoplastic syndrome rather than a heredomacular degeneration or hereditary retinal degeneration. Then hereditary retinal degeneration may have a family history. That's also you look for. And clinical science wise, like usually the CR, MAR in the initial stages, the fundus looks almost normal. The signs of the retinal signs, which are there, retinal pigmentosa may not be there. Unless you're looking at like the, one of the uh, white dot syndrome kind of retinal, retinal pigmentosa types, then like the retina looks almost normal. So symptoms are there and you do visual fields which shows that constriction and the ear, the electrodiagnostics uh, just show that there is a retinal anomaly, but retina looks nearly normal. Age group and sudden onset of symptom, then I would think of paraneoplastic syndrome. So the next question goes to Dr. Hani. The, uh, is there any ERG uh, specific markers which would uh, give us an indication that it is a paraneoplastic or a Karmar associated retinopathy? Well, in, in my opinion, I mean, the ERG would give you uh, some hint or clue, but it's not diagnostic. It will show you a diffuse dysfunction maybe of the rods only or the rod and bones dysfunction, which you cannot use as a diagnostic right. marker in these cases. I think one of the important signs also to distinguish between uh, these two entities and the hereditary disease is the symmetry of clinical findings in both eyes. Usually in hereditary diseases, you find both eyes affected to the same extent, but here uh, there is some asymmetry. And these diagnoses, cannot be done except if you keep them in mind while seeing the patient. You have to put it in your mind and look at it. Sure. Uh, thank you. So, uh, yes, sir. Elisa, please. So this is to highlight the fact that this is some autoretinal antibodies in the blood. is not tantamount to a diagnosis of an autoimmune retinopathy. For simple reason that antibodies can be generated by a disease itself. For example, retinitis pigmentosa. If you do Apparently, antibodies, you probably find them because the retinitis is undergoing it for a degeneration. There is a school of thought among people who specialize in retinitis pigmentosa treatments that if in the presence of flashes and in the presence of relatively more progressive, more progressive loss of peel, in a patient with a known diagnosis of one peel, if they find auto retinal antibodies positive, they will still treat it as an autoimmune retinopathy which is superimposed over RP. It's a controversy. Because there is no end point. If you treat them also, you don't know. You can't see any improvement because already all the vision is lost. And progression is a known problem with the disease itself. You can't even stop the disease. So it's a very uh, controversial uh, indication for treating them with steroids and immunosuppressants. But there is a school of thought. Some people believe that you treat them as well. It's just a, I just want to put it in the perspective that Autoretinal antibodies in the blood doesn't mean autoimmune retinopathy. This was my question to you, but you have already answered it. That's true. So it was very pertinent. So the question goes to Suganashree, madam, uh, that in cases of uh, this uh, carcinoma associated retinopathy or slash AIR autoimmune retinopathy, if we think the patient is to start with an AIR or an autoimmune retinopathy, what would be the treatment of choice or whether do we treat or do we observe or do we ask the patient to do some tests and come back to us to rule out what would you uh, do in those cases where there is a doubt 
of management whether it is a borderline case or always there is a doubt obviously so how do you want to manage that case whether you want to as as was shown in ffa which is showing a disc leak so whether the disc leak should be whether oral steroids or immunosuppressants if you are thinking if it's a air whether you would want to treat it or whether you want to evaluate it further like as told antibodies are not specific so how would you want to manage a case it's a very nice question First, what I would usually do is evaluate the patient completely because before you brand them as either as a car or as an AI, it's very clear that you are you are diagnosing an entity with a lethal disease. So before that, a complete panel of evaluation to rule out a hidden carcinoma. That is what is the first step. So once that is done, that is when I would start the treatment itself. Before that, I would not err on the treatment. Rather, I would probably start the patient on observation and watch for it, and then only start treatment, not directly. Okay. So, sure, uh, yeah. So, like ma'am said, uh, in the setting of a subacute onset of symptoms, uh, uh, we when you are suspecting autoimmune retinopathy, it's first thing is to look for uh, rule out the malignant. If the patient is already not in the hence, like she showed, we did a PET scan to look for any malignant. In case you don't find any malignant, then it automatically becomes autoimmune, non-paranoplastic autoimmune. Diagnosis of exclusion is what we are discussing. And the treatment becomes, the standard treatment is high dose steroids. That doesn't work, you step up to immunosuppressant. And in some cases, they even try plasma paresis and immunoglobin. So it's not much effect, yeah. That's, yeah. Thank you, thank you. So, uh, thank you. Yeah, sure, Kalpita. Uh, in these cases also, because they need a long-term follow-up to look for, because many of them develop malignancy years Later after Later on, the yes, 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 yes. Okay, Kalpita, thank you. Thank you for interesting presentation. So, the next presenter is uh, a, a keynote address by Dr. Santosh Unavar. And the uh, title of the talk is, Is it retinoblastoma or something else? Differentiating with receipts, exudative RD, and different mass lesions. Please, sir. Thank you for the opportunity. I'll be speaking on is it retinoblastoma, the mask or the masquerade. Awareness is the key to early diagnosis of retinoblastoma and subsequent management. Leukocoria happens to be the most important for presenting symptom as well as sign. There's a huge list of lesions that are associated with white reflex, some of which are pertinent to retina specialists, some of which are not. But the 10 most common pseudo-retinoblastomas in a specialty practice of retina oncology would be as listed here, Coats disease, Topsilis, followed by persistent pitial vasculature, vitreous hemorrhage, toxocariasis, etc. It also has geographic variation and it also depends on the age at which the patient presents to you. Children younger than one year, PFP predominates, whereas in slightly older age group, two to five years or older than five years, Coats disease actually tops the list. Five most common pseudoretinoblastomas are Coats disease, uh, persistent hyperplastic primary vitreous, toxocariasis, astrocytic hematoma, and medulloepithelioma. The quality of reflex is drastically different when you compare Coates disease with retinoblastoma. In Coates disease, you find this golden yellow reflex or xanthocoria, whereas in retinoblastoma, you find the yellow reflex or the whitish yellow reflex. So the type of reflex that you see is totally different between retinoblastoma and Coats disease and that's how the initial pointers are. When you obviously do a closer examination, you find that there is intraretinal and subretinal exudation and also dilated blood vessels ending in peripheral retinal telangiectasia. Whereas this is what you see in retinoblastoma. The color is very different and the blood vessels are not so dilated and obviously peripheral retinal telangiectasia is missing. If you look at the blood vessels themselves, there is segmental dilatation of blood vessels and alteration of the caliber of the blood vessel along the course in course this is whereas in retinoblastoma you find a large blood vessel simply dipping into the tumor not to emerge again that is how you differentiate the type of blood vessels and in uh, course disease if you look at the posterior pole you will find exudation which is refractile which is just in the posterior pole whereas the lesion is in the periphery whereas in retinoblastoma you will find an obvious tumor on ultrasound you may find retinal thickening in course disease Whereas in retinoblastoma, you find an obvious tumor and FFA can further help differentiate. In persistent hyperplastic primary vitreous, there is relative microphthalmus. The cornea may not fit into the diagnosis of a microphthalmus, but it may be smaller than the contralateral side. 
that is one of the clues and also prominent ciliary processes and posterior postapolar cataract leading to a, a, a fold that is what you see on ultrasonography or, or arising from the disc and attaching to the posterior pole of the lens whereas in retinoblastoma you don't find that in toxocariasis there might be spillover inflammation spillover inflammation will be in terms of anterior uveitis whereas it's very rare to find anterior uveitis in retinoblastoma if toxocariasis is in the periphery you will find a traction fold a falciform fold whereas none of that would be present in retinoblastoma if it's a posterior macular lesion toxocariasis there is drag disc appearance because of desmoplastic activity the blood vessels get dragged towards the disc whereas in retinoblastoma that doesn't happen in retinal astrocytic hematoma there are two variants non calcified variant and the calcified variant the nature of calcification dif differs it could be fish egg kind of calcification in astrocytic hematoma whereas in retinoblastoma it is more solid but sometimes there are lesions which this obviously is astrocytoma whereas this it may be dif difficult for you to differentiate it from a retinocytoma and astrocytoma of course this patient had other features of tuberous sclerosis that helped us clinch the diagnosis medulloepitheluma is a peripheral ciliary body tumor it's an embryonic tumor so patients have a lens coloboma or a zonular coloboma that is associated with it whereas in retinoblastoma that doesn't happen also a posterior subcapsular cataract or a retrolental non vascularized membrane as you see here with zonules missing there or a retrolental vascularized membrane are features of medulloepithelioma now uh, there are some congenital lesions as well this is a patient with a uh, optic disc coloboma with what appears to be optic nerve thickening that is nothing but a cyst in the optic nerve that was actually misdiagnosed in the presence of cataract and unable to visualize the fundus as a retinoblastoma with optic nerve extension and that can happen coming to seats in the anterior chamber these are depository anterior chamber seats that are typical of retinoblastoma this is infiltrative anterior chamber seats typical of retinoblastoma but retinoblastoma can also simulate uveitis while this is very typical of retinoblastoma sometimes this can be confusing because there is a leveled hypopion there this is also a manifestation of retinoblastoma if somebody has actually thought it was uveitis and that the osodex implant lying inside the vitreous in a patient with retinoblastoma whereas in medulloepithelioma the cells are translucent and sago granule kind cells which are deposited in the anterior chamber it could also have a heaped up hypopion which is a feature of medulloepithelioma whereas refractile crystals indicate sports disease in vitreous seeds of course in retinoblastoma we have a classification dust pure cloud and mixed and if you find some amount of cells in the vitreous seeds like this it could be a manifestation of candida endophthalmitis fungal endophthalmitis or even uh, uh, leukemia for that matter so there are some other masks such as inflammation of the eye as a result of a pre existing retinoblastoma that is because of sterile inflammation that is induced by a necrotic tumor you can see inflammation around the sclera on this imaging it could even look like orbital cellulitis but imaging clinches the diagnosis so ilid edema simulating orbital cellulitis was a manifestation of retinoblastoma in this child and this i already showed but enlarged cornea simulating congenital glaucoma not to forget the lurking reflex behind thysis bulbi again there is this yellow white reflex in thysis you find peripheral calcification choroidal calcification whereas in retinoblastoma you find intraocular calcification when you do imaging this was a case case of hyphema with a history of trauma you can even see a small lid laceration there full chamber hyphema which was drained by a glaucoma specialist 6 months later child presents with extraocular extension and intracranial extension so hyphema can be ominous this is a child with traumatic vitreous hemorrhage or that is what thought it was that dilated blood vessel actually precludes that diagnosis somebody did a vitrectomy and then a scleral buckle now on top of the buckle you find a creamy lesion and now even posterior to the buckle the lesion has advanced this was an atypical variant of a uh, old retinoblastoma an older child diffuse infiltrative retinoblastoma where you don't find a mass at all all that has happened is this is the normal thickness of the retina this retina probably is twice as thick there is no mass that you see there is no calcium that is visible so these can easily be misdiagnosed and on enucleation obviously it was retinoblastoma so i would conclude saying that there are masquerades which are Uh, which may masquerade as some other lesions in retinoblastoma and these are generally seen in older children 
Diagnosis is clinched by a good examination, the anesthesia, ultrasound, B scan, MRI, and CT scan. You must be uh, cautious to rule out ectoblastoma and avoid inadvertent intraocular surgery. And that is the point to note. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, sir. Very impressive presentations with a uh, uh, lot of images which are very eye-catchy. So the question to you is, sir, I am doing a surgery and when I have sent the uh, report for a, or, or the vitreous biopsy for HPE or, or culture, we have found out that it's a retinoblastoma. What should be my next action or next plan of action? Being all VR surgeons over here, what is your advice? I think there is a presentation on that topic, right? Next, please. It's uh, is the cat out of the bag or something of that sort. Anyway, it all depends on what kind of surgery have we done. If it's a just a fine needle aspiration cytology from a location which can easily be, easily be localized, and if the eye is salvageable, I would still go ahead with chemotherapy, chemotherapy. intravenous or intra arterial. But if it is a full blown report, parsena vitrectomy with conjunctival peritomy, etc., then obviously. Cat is already out of the bag and you have to be very cautious if you want to preserve those eyes. Ideally, it would be a case for enucleation with adjuvantry. That's that's very true. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So the next question is, uh, uh, how would be the response of seeds be assessed? Uh, so Dr. Subhaneshwari, madam, would you want to take that? So when we are treating a patient of ret retinoblastoma with seeds and once either we have given an intraocular or a chemotherapy, how would we look for the response or how to grade or either decide whether the seeds are responding, not responding and what would be the management? First, when we look at the seeds, so like when you have a cloud, when you have a dust, when you have a spherule, so we know that the responses in a spherule so they are going to be really poor compared to what the dust would be. Dust. So then you watch for the regression patterns. So usually what happens is if your patient has developed seeds over a period of time or they have presented to you with seeds, the patient who presents to you with seeds would invariably do better with only the chemo because we wouldn't start upfront intravitreal chemo in That's them. True. So in them it would be usually the intra-arterial chemo or it goes along with an intravenous chemo which is affordable and again that we discuss and we take it over. And if the patients do not respond to your initial chemotherapy, that is when we would want to give an intravitreal chemotherapy in point in time, assuming whether you would like to give to a or whether you would like to self-fulan depending on the toxicity and what is the unilaterality of the patient then we would subject them for an intravitreal chemo. Otherwise, upfront presenting patient will receive only the primary But most important when you are dealing with seeds management is a UBM. If you do not do a UBM, you would never know that the patient is harboring seeds at the parts plana. So a 12 clock hour UBM would always be recommended when I am doing a seed management. Yes, sir. There are two things that can happen. One is the dust like seeds can vanish. So the amount of the response will be by seen with the degrees in the amount the of the seed which are there. Or they will become more yes. well-defined. There will not be a halo and it will look more like a calcific spherule which is there in the vitreous cavity. The spherules, the halo goes away, but the balls may remain. So you look for it not to grow, but then essentially shrinkage in the size, disappearance or calcific residue. It yes. also depends on the type of drug that you use. With melphalan, ferules actually become more compact and fibrotic and remain floating around, whereas with uh, topotecan, they break up into smaller fragments and obviously disappear. So I think it is drug dependent. Drug dependent. Can I add a comment? Yeah. Yeah, Dr. Hani, yeah, you. Uh... Yes. Uh, first of all, I agree with uh, my colleagues that. The seeds, the appearance of calcific seeds is a sign of a very good response. Second, melphalan intravitreally is very effective in dealing with these, even those the ciliary body lesion, as my colleague just mentioned. And uh, Moliere in, uh, in Lausanne in Switzerland, he is even treating anterior chamber seeds with intracameral melphalan. The second comment I would like to add that the most challenging cases in uh, masquerading cases are stage 5 post disease versus diffuse stage E retinoblastoma. 
And in response to your question, what to do if you have done surgery in these cases? Several years ago, I had a case of uh, total retinal detachment in a child. He had ultrasonography twice, MRI, CT, all of them were pointing to a diagnosis of Coats disease. So I went in, I drained the subretinal fluid, but for some reason I decided to take a sample of this subretinal fluid and it proved to be harboring malignant cells. So what we have done is inoculation, external beam irradiation to the orbit and chemotherapy. And this has been 10 years ago and he's doing well. Thank you, Dr. Hyman. Sir, do you want to comment? I think you have to add just one point that uh, it's the importance of documenting with photography is very really vital when you want to compare the improvement. Especially if you are talking about multiple lesions and seeds, it's very really useful to have compared pictures from one interview to another interview. And also the importance of the same surgeon following up the patient. Because the visual impression visual. also is there to help you to aid to decide whether it's improving or not. The third point is that if this patient over a period of time develops posterior which is detachment, suddenly you'll find that the seeds all collect in one place. It is apparent worsening, but actually you will know by the overall picture it's just apparent worsening because everything has collected in one place. One thing you can sure, thank you. I would request uh, Dr. Vishal to please take and uh, please finish your question, ma'am. Yeah. So when could we take up a case which has uh, undergone brachytherapy for retinogenous retinal detachment repair? How soon could we take up the case for routine vitreous surgery? Very nice. Retinoblastoma case. Um, I think the obviously the sooner you fix the retina, the better. You want, you want to wait for six months period, by is gone. So there is a school of thought now that if you have treated the patient adequately, even if there's a residual tumor in the eye, if you want to solve it, then there's only seeing eye and if patient, the parents are definitely not willing to initiate such an eye, to pain, remove the, uh, the residual tumor, to retrieve seeds, with, of course, inflammatory infusion of melphalon throughout the surgery, then at the end of the surgery, put in silicone oil. I've had one patient at least on three patients where I had to operate when the tumor was still instead clinically active. This is not just calcific residue, but the need still the active tumor present. Then, fortunately, all three are being quite well without any systemic spread. But these are patients where you need to tell the parents the risk of uh, spread before you operate on them. Uh, thank you, thank you, ma'am. So the next presentation is the gr uh, Great Masquerader, which is uh, yet another lymphoma diagnosis and uh, treating it. Thank you, Dr. Vishal. Thank you, Divyansh. Uh, thank you, VRSA, for the opportunity. Uh, my topic for today's presentation is the Great Masquerader Primary Central Nervous System Lymphoma, the ocular variant. I have no financial disclosure. The objectives of my presentation will cover four aspects of lymphoma. First, will be related to nomenclature. Second related to clinical presentation and the diagnostic dilemma, masquerading features with other UVIT conditions. Third, the role of diagnostic biopsy. And last, I will touch upon the management part of the lymphoma. First, nomenclature, as we all know, primary central nervous system lymphoma is the subtype of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. The historically, the lymphoma was termed as reticular cell sarcoma and microgliomatosis, but over the decades in understanding the pathology of the eye, we came to that this is not the correct terminology. Then two decades later, the next terminology which was introduced was primary intraocular lymphoma. But the issue is related to the lymphoma involving the retina, which is a high-grade diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. And the lymphoma involving the choroid or the uvel component, which is low-grade extra marginal zone lymphoma. So again, pathologically, there are two different variants. Treatment differs. So this terminology is also incorrect as per our understanding. The most commonly used terminology in the literature is primary vitreoretinal lymphoma. But however, the terminology itself suggests that it is originates in the eye. And that's not the case because we all know the disease is, has a homing mechanism and the main uh, 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 area where it originates is in the central nervous compartments. So we, our, through our, our understanding through the disease and through the various literature, we came out with a new terminology which is primary central nervous system lymphoma, ocular variant, which is a subtype of uh, primary central nervous system lymphoma. Second part is related to the clinical presentation. As we all know, usually the patient present with a history of waxing and waning course of uveitis. Patients who respond to steroids, but as soon as the steroids are tapered or stopped, the uveitic components or the inflammation part comes back again. Vitreoretis is the most common kind of uh, presentation you see in, in across patients with lymphoma. The, the difference what you see in vitreoretis is the, the size of the cells are much more larger as compared to what you see in uveitic uh, vitreoretis inflammation. 
the classical fundus appearance what you see is yellowish sub retinal pigment epithelial infiltrates which follows over the time to be a classical leopard skin pigmentation and last but not the least i think the imaging modality what we usually prefer to give a confirmation of diagnosis of based on our clinical examination and history is the optical coherence tomography which shows the presence of multiple hyperreflective deposits in the vitreous as well as in the sub rp space characteristics of cellular infiltrates of the lymphoma so i will be discussing four interesting cases where the was the masquerading feature and this is the first case which uh, as you can see in the right side was the creamy yellowish region seen over the posterior pole involving the mat involving the optic disc as well as multiple retinal hemorrhages on the nasal side in the lower uh, front of photograph you could see there was creamy yellowish region kind of discrete seen in the uh, so nasal part the corresponding left eye also showed multiple small pigment uh, small uh, rp infiltrates the highlighting feature which was kind of seen on the oct again was presence of these hyperreflective deposits in the vitreous the issue of vitreitis as well as small nodular rp elevations such as issue of cellular infiltrates this patient was already on a uh, one month course of valgancyclovir which was patient not responding and the diagnostic biopsy was contemplated which proved the case to be a lymphoma second case this was a case of uh, ocular syphilis patient was diagnosed elsewhere to ocular syphilis all complete thorough uh, ubetic workup was negative when the patient was referred this was the fundus binding in the right eye as well as the left eye there were multiple miliary lesions uh, as well as there was a area of full thickness retinal uh, involvement seen in the supratemporal arcade in the left eye corresponding ocd also showed the same however when we saw the ocd through the macular area in the left eye again you could see there's multiple hyperreflective deposits in the sub rp space and there we contemplated might be the patient might have a kind of lymphoma involvement diagnostic biopsy again came out positive three twenty which uh, confirm a diagnosis third case this was kind of little bit challenging the fundus photograph was looking more in favor of portal metastasis the autofluorescence as well as the fluorescence angiography showed hypo hyper lesions corresponding both to rp atrophy as well as the uh, uh, infiltrates involved in the portal layer the oct was kind of not very kind of uh, Uh, very similar to what we see in kind of lymphoma the multiple large retinal pigment epithelial attachments with hyperreflective deposits seen in the rp layer however the whole body pet ct scan became negative the patient was again subjected to biopsy and this time the again the biopsy came positive for lymphoma last but not the least this was a case of a subretinal abscess clinically look like tuberculoma patient had any positive history of family sister suffering from tuberculosis again cervical lymph node came positive for tuberculosis patient was already on ATT for last 4 months but the lesion kept on increasing on size on treatment and at this time when we saw the patient we thought we we'll let us take the repeat biopsy from the cervical lymph nodes and the biopsy again came positive for anaplastic kinase positive diffuse large basal lymphoma of the nodes from the neck region so this was a case of secondary vitreoretinal lymphoma so biopsy as we all know is a gold standard to diagnose lymphoma so the role of biopsy is uh, to confirm our clinical examination as well as the oct imaging what we saw the biopsy samples what we usually perform is undiluted vitreous specimen the uh, cut rate what we use is low cut rate around 800 to 800 to 1000 cuts per minute as well as with high vacuum 400 to 500 the main uh, difference what we are doing right now is to take the sample directly underneath from the sub rp space by using a soft tip cannula attached to a fluke needle which is attached to a 2 ml syringe and the sister uh, collects the material in the syringe which is then transported uh, a, if within the time permits freshly to the pathology if not then it is kind of mixed with the 70% absolute alcohol and the cells are fixed the important point i think which need to rule out uh, make sure that whenever we contemplate taking any biopsy the patient should be off steroids for at least minimum 2 weeks prior to taking the biopsy last thing is about the treatment whenever we diagnose i think we need to stage the disease in terms of staging we advise mri brain spinal cord csf analysis and not to forget ultrasound test is particularly if a patient is male and the treatment regimen what we follow is to use the treatment which has been uh, ad uh, administered by kobe pay group from israel where we they give 25 injections per year of intravitreal methotrexate and these are the two cases what i showed previously this is the case first uh, uh, where we give 16 injection of methotrexate over the course of 7 uh, months and you could see the beautiful response in terms of resolution of uh, hyperreflective deposits in the vitreous compartment as well as in sub rp space and this was the second case again you could see the response in terms of resolution of uh, infiltrates in the sub rp space 
to conclude i would say uh, primary central nervous system lymphoma popular went to the great masquerade this positive history of vaccine of any course of disease should kind of be a red flag and should always think about underlying this is the lymphoma diagnostic vitreous as well as the sub rpa biopsy is the gold standard in terms of methotrexate is the first choice however rituximab can be a second line of treatment if it is not responding to your methotrexate most important point i think which i want to highlight is 85% of all the lymphoma ocular lymphoma kind of involves the cns compartment within kind of 15 to 24 months so mri imaging every 6 months is what they are usually advise and early diagnosis and treatment with multidisciplinary approach is the treatment of them thank you Uh, thank you vishal nice presentation nice documentation uh, so the question to lg sir is uh, what would be the tips in giving intravitreal injection of melphalan which we give for this uh, cases of lymphoma Methotrexate. so sorry methotrexate so because the most common toxicity associated with it is corneal epithelial toxicity which is pretty significant in because as we know that we would not give one single injection there would be battery of injections which are to be given so what it is said that if you pop it in the course when you are course when you are with the product be the very uh, important thing to stop injection but after the first one month you are anyway going to give once in a week usually the cardiac tends to record between the injection or the immediate that will be the results you know beyond giving a lot of lubricants what else you can do to stop the results you have not very sure to avoid the spill over the means what for those because you always say you don't want it to spill over into back and yes all that. yeah other than that in spite of that people have reported yes 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 Which is not your RPM? Which is not your supposed to use? Not alka because with this the loss of cells in morphology is very very high. So the question to Mahesh sir would be that what would be uh, the red flags when you see a fundus would give you a, a hint that it can be a lymphoma or my differentials can be one of lymphoma either vitreal or uh, uveal depending. Upon the case, so starting with the history or what's usually these patients have had a long history of being treated with uveitis and history of recurrent uveitis. Fundus wise, yes, there could be an asymmetric vitreous involvement in the form of vitreous uh, cells, which can be there. What was usually the giveaway is if there is a subretinal deposit. So usually a subretinal yellow white leopard 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 spot pigmentation, like what uh, we shall showed in the first case on the nasal side. If you see that, that it's that is an indication. And in the presence of vitreous cells, it can be difficult to make out. But sometimes, if you look at that, that will be. And OCT is rather characteristic. Uh, many characteristic features are there which should make a suspect. So the thickening of the photoreceptor layer, the sub RP infiltration, the thickening of the retina, as well as the vitreous cells. So if you see these, then you would suspect lymphoma. And in the in the presence of all this, and sometimes you do a biopsy, and then still not. Conclusive. Sometimes I have resorted to a therapeutic challenge. So in one eye, I have injected a methotrexate to see if the patient responds. Then you suspect that it's likely to be a lymphoma. Then you go aggressive on proving it histopathologically, and then go ahead. Sure. Extension to this, can I ask this question to the panel? We have a one-eyed person and has it's treated as uveitis, but you suspect it could be lymphoma. And all anti-uveitic treatment has been has failed. And patient is refusing biopsy because he is worried about Being losing the due to the surgical complications of biopsy. What would you do? Would you do methotrexate injection and see the response? Uh, can I add a comment, please? I don't think we should treat it without confirmation of diagnosis. There I are. If they don't agree, I mean, you have to. Can we? If they do biopsy, it is negative. Right. They get back to square one. Right, so if you, I mean, the kind of biopsy that Vishal showed, yeah, CSF tab will be negative, MRI will be negative, but the crux is in taking subretinal infiltrate. That material, if you are able to take it from a lesion which is slightly in the mid periphery, etc., then that is one. And second is the role of liquid biopsy from atrius, atrius and vitreous is coming up. Gene-based diagnosis, PCR-based diagnosis. Yeah. I think retinochoral biopsy might be the one. 
treated conservatively with any form of treatment like local therapy intra arterial chemotherapy intra vitreal chemotherapy but without enucleation stage 1 is patient treated with nucleation but on histopathology everything is fine stage 2 is i enucleated with high risk feature on histopathology stage 3 is orbital retinoblastoma and stage 4 is metastatic disease so i will discuss stage 2 3 and 4 management in my further slides i will start with the stage 2 disease so in stage 2 disease on after enucleation histopathology shows the high risk features the high risk features which are widely accepted are post laminar optic nerve infiltration involvement of optic nerve transaction masking extra scleral tissue infiltration and massive choroidal invasion which should be greater than 3 mm so these are the widely accepted high risk features on histopathology So, uh, Dr. Swati Kaliki has published an article on 51 patients with post-enucleation high-risk features, and all the patients were treated with adjuvant standard dose chemotherapy using vincristine, etoposide, and carboplatin. And none of the cases developed metastasis or death during mean follow-up of 66 months. So, adjuvant treatment in these cases with the standard dose chemotherapy is useful. Uh, Dr. Santosh Manavar. has also published on untreated patient with high risk 
स्टोल पैथोलॉजिकल फीचर्स एंड दे नोटिस मेटास्टेसिस इन ट्वेंटी फोर परसेंट ऑफ द केसेस ऑफन लीडिंग टू द डेथ तो एनी पेशेंट शोइंग हाई रिस्क फीचर शुड बी ट्रीटेड विद द स्टैंडर्ड डोज कीमोथेरापी फॉर सिक्स साइकल्स स्टेज थ्री इज द ऑर्बिटल रेटिनल डिसीज ऑर्बिटल रेटिनो ब्लास्टोमा इट कैन इन्वॉल्व ऑर्बिट कैन इन्वॉल्व ऑप्टिक नर्व कैन इन्वॉल्व फुल थिकनेस क्लेरा और कैन हैव एक्स्ट्रा स्क्लेरल एक्सटेंशन दिज ऑल आर कैटेगरी इज क्लासिफाइड अंडर ऑर्बिटल रेटिनो ब्लास्टोमा विच इज स्टेज थ्री so any patient with stage 3 or stage 4 retinoblastoma should undergo detailed physical examination including palpation of the regional lymph nodes and if lymph nodes are palpable then fine needle aspiration biopsy of the same is uh, indicated mri brain with and orbit with and without contrast should be done chest x ray ultrasound abdomen bone marrow biopsy csf cytology and pet scan if metastasis is suspected this so all patient should be thoroughly evaluated this is the treatment algorithm uh, for orbital retinoblastoma all patient should receive high dose systemic chemotherapy every 3 weeks followed by surgery enucleation or excentration after 6 to 9 cycles if tumor shrinks followed by external beam radiotherapy using 45 to 50 gray to the orbit and followed by completion of 12 cycles of high dose systemic chemotherapy and all patient should be uh, followed every 6 monthly with imaging and bone marrow biopsy at least for 3 months after treatment coming to metastatic disease with stage 4 disease this is in metastatic retinoblastoma stage 4a is regional metastasis or distant metastasis not involving central nervous system while stage 4 disease can involve cns directly via extension can be part of trilateral retinoblastoma where bilateral retinoblastoma is associated with pinealoblastoma or distant metastasis can involve cns this is the one recent article published last month uh, they described management of stage 4a and stage 4b retinoblastoma using four cycles of high dose chemotherapy with vincristian etoposide instead of carboplatin they use cisplatin and cyclophosphamide and if the tumor showed more than partial response one more cycle of high dose chemotherapy with thiotepa and etoposide and carboplatin were given along with autologous stem cell transplant and any residual tumor post chemotherapy received radiation so event free survival at 3 years was nearly 76% for stage 4a disease while 14% for stage 4b disease so they concluded for stage 4a therapy was highly effective but for stage 4b still more effective therapy is required coming to uvl melanoma uh, so uvl melanoma with extraocular extension this the case was published by the ars et al uh, in figure a we can see one uh, mushroom shaped lesion which was diagnosed as choroidal melanoma and was treated with plaque brachytherapy after 18 months tumor showed regression but when they did ultrasound it showed extraocular extension and the eye was denucleated so this case shows the also that uh, ultrasound can be very useful in diagnosis extraocular extension of the retin uh, choroidal melanoma um, Dr. Shields has published uh, on uh, plaque radiotherapy for management of uveal melanoma with extraocular extension. So, 17 eyes of 17 patients with melanoma with less than 3 millimeter thick extraocular extension were treated with plaque radiotherapy. So, in all of that cases, the uh, conjunctiva and tenons fascia around extraocular extension were kept intact, and plaque was placed directly on the tumor, including. that conjunctiva and tenon fascia and they concluded plaque radiotherapy is a reasonable option for selected cases of uveal melanoma with clinical visible eoe less than 3 mm in thickness same group has published on massive orbital extension of posterior uveal melanoma and out of two, more than 2000 patient they found 0.5% of the patient had massive orbital extension and if patient is detected extra scleran extension at the time of enucleation or on pathology should be treated with the external beam radiation and if patient has massive orbital extension should be treated with eyelid sparing excentration followed by external beam radiation metastatic disease associated with uveal melanoma is very difficult to treat and rate of metastasis could be 50% by 15 years and one year survival is reported to be around 15% in patient with uveal melanoma with metastasis there are no specific guidelines of treatment but various medicines like sunitrim epilimumab nivolumab are available 
Hepatic metastasis can be treated with high dose immunoembolization or intraarterial chemotherapy that is targeted chemotherapy. So to conclude, extraocular extension in cases of RB and uveal melanoma can be managed with multimodal approach to prolong the life of patients. Special thanks to Dr. Shields. Thank yeah, you. yeah, Dr. Kushal, thanks, thanks for the presentation. So uh, the first part of the discussion we already had uh, regarding if the eye is invaded in retinoblastoma. The second part of the discussion, if the eye of a melanoma is invaded, would there be any change of plan of management? So LG sir, Santosh sir, whether you would have comments on that? So if a case... Uh... Yeah, in melanoma now it has become a standard of care to do fine needle aspiration cytology from the area where you are applying the plaque and then sending it for genetic analysis before you place plaque. So in every patient that is done in the West for plaque brachytherapy has had extraocular extension that way, microscopic. So there is no additional precaution necessary if you have just done a fine needle aspiration cytology in a patient with melanoma. But again, if you have done a full-blown surgery and if you suspect that the orbit is already seeded, then since chemotherapy does not work in melanoma, the only option would be extended enucleation or excentration, followed by radiation. The purpose of this title of the talk, total of the title, to surgeons, so if in case there's a retinal attachment going straight into a surgery and find a melanoma intraoperatively, what would you do? That was the reason why the talk was placed. Similarly, if you think there is an end of the mitosis and you made an eye with retinoblastoma and find that, what do you do? That's a question. Yes. Yeah, I can I add a comment, please? Yes. Uh, uh, first of all, for uh, retinoblastoma cases, there was once a debate whether to start chemotherapy before inoculation or not. But this has been said that you should do inoculation first because if you start chemotherapy first, you will mask the high risk criteria that necessitate post inoculation uh, chemotherapy. So this is one point. The second is for metastatic disease for choroidal melanoma. Recently, uh, a drug has uh, come into the market, which is Tepentafast. And Tepentafast has prolonged the survival of patients with liver metastasis up to seven years. And it relies actually on binding on one side the melanoma cell and bringing the T-cells of the patient, binding them on the other side to destroy the tumor. And, but it works only in patients with HLA-207 uh, uh, positive, which is uh, about 50% of cases only. And there are now clinical trials going on to try the pentafas in patients with large choroidal melanomas, even with brachytherapy, and those who have developed inoculation to reduce the incidence of metastasis over five years. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. So, so you wanted to... Uh... So, if you open the eye and find an RD yes. having harboring a melanoma, I'd probably ignore the RD from the perspective of the decision-making whether to inoculate the eye or to try and salvage the eye. You, you're inside the eye, maybe you can always put an oil if you cannot... If you have seen the tumor and you don't know what to do, just put in oil and fix the retina first and evaluate what is the size of the tumor. The diffuse infiltrative melanoma, something which you would feel normally even without the RD would probably inoculate. You probably inoculate the guy, but not in the same sitting because you don't take the consent for the preservation. You have to do it in another sitting. But if it is salvageable eye, even with oil in the eye, you can do back into the pain of harm done. So it's a, right. your decision of managing the melanoma is probably outside the diagnosis of retinal attachment. One more question following to this is because right now we being VR surgeons, uh, endoresection is in vogue. <laughs> I was discussing. Uh, like I, I, I had two doctor profiles. So if there are two situations when you may be doing a vitrectomy. One is if there's a vitreous hemorrhage or when there's a retinal patch. If there's a vitreous hemorrhage associated with melanoma, then there is a likelihood it's a necrotic to spread into the vitreous So those eyes may most likely need an anyway. So if you go inside, and suspect a mass patient, then what we can practice to take the vitreous specimen and send it for cytology. Those tests do not damage in the future and try to use cryotherapy, triple series cryotherapy, and wait for the histopathology. Once it comes to be a melanoma and there is a diffuse melanoma, then you would probably eliminate it. So I would probably not like, uh, like open up the connective over the sclerotomy sites, leave the connective over there, and enucleate a modified enucleation. 
there is a controversy whether you want to follow it up with the radiation or not. So radiation probably may not help much in the melanoma, which is gone into the orbit. But if it's a retinal detachment, and like Dr. Okay, LG said, if it's a localized tumor, to either fix the retina by doing the drainage electrotomy and aspirate the fluid, not with the fluid, but into a syringe so that there is no spillage of the cells onto the eye, and then reattach the retina and put in oil, or leave it alone, close the eye, and then send it for subsequent bracket. Uh, thank you, Man. Uh, so the next presentation would be by Dr. Subhaneshwari, and the title of the talk is uh, Vascular Tumors and Anti VEGF. So uh, just till the time Madam is arranging, what would be the uh, overall opinion for doing a vitrectomy for an endo resection? Yes, no, in one word. Only post bracket therapy if there is a toxic tumor. So, so one word. One word. One word. Yes, no. No. Uh, I was getting married. No, yes. No. <laughs> yes. After after gamma light and addition of the tumor, so, not as an only thing. So two adjuncts to it. So yeah. Thank you, sir. So actually speaking, like endo resection is again we should have a dialogue with the patient what the patient wants an eye salvage or an eye sacrifice. If they want a salvage, then we have to do all the multimodal treatments like you do the gamma ray and then you do it or you do the external beam radiation and then do the uh, your uh, vitrectomy with endoresection or the option of plucking it up and then doing. So all these modalities will follow the patient wants the eye and depending on how big is your tumor. Because you yes. shouldn't go into thysis after you do the surgery. Answer yes or no. Man. I am being diplomatic. No, no, no. The answer is yes or no. <laughs> That's why I didn't. That, that's why I didn't order any adjuncts. Okay, fine. Carry on. All thank you. oncologists are diplomatic, you know. <laughs> thanks, thanks, yeah. So, a warm good evening to all of you, and I would like to thank Dr. MPS sir uh, for having us here today. It's a great learning experience, and the hospitality which has been shown is amazing. Thank you, sir, and it's a very great, good organizing team. So coming on into the topic of vascular tumors and anti vgf query. I'm also wondering why this query was there. But then, yes, I want... All the titles in this session are, are... aimed from the point of uh, the vitreous. Okay. So now, moving on into the intraocular vascular tumors. So what do we have? Retinal capillary hemangioma, retinal cavernous hemangioma, circumscribed choroidal hemangioma, retinal arteriovenous malformation, retinal vasoproliferative tumors. So for the want of time, we will do the commonest ones. Retinal capillary hemangioma, the circumscribed choroidal hemangioma, and the ret retinal vasoproliferative tumors. So coming on into the capillary hemangioma, they are either sporadic or associated with the von Hippel's disease. Earliest and the most common manifestation of VHL would be the retinal capillary hemangioma. The location would be the optic nerve head, juxtapapillary area, or the peripheral retina, the temporal quadrant. And what is it composed of? They are composed of endothelial cells, pericytes, homistromal cells, and the mast cells. So now here is to understand what is the pathogenesis and why do we think that would anti-VGF work? So it is the inability to degrade the hypoxia inducible factors. So leading on to the overproduction of the VEGF and the yet another point is the upregulation of the other hypoxia inducible factors. So we have two things here. So now moving on into the cases. So here is a patient who is a 10 year old female who is a von Hippel Linda patient. She had renal cell carcinoma as well. She presented with counting finger close to face. And what you see is like a peripheral angioma, which is there. We had treated this patient with a vastin and then did the peripheral cryo. So what we notice here is there is reduction in the exudation, which you can all see here. The exudates which were there are coming down. And then after three months, what we also see is further one more shot of a vastin. She did well with in terms of regression of the exudates and of course the cryotherapy we repeated one more time so she did not have a great visual acuity she had only 3 by 60 vision and she's still currently under follow-up so here is yet another gentleman who's a 25 year old male and you can see this has got multiple hemangiomas here so now these hemangiomas are like the peripheral ones and the mid peripheral ones are all the ones which we had treated with the uh, ttt and the laser photocoagulation and you can see the arrow which is pointing out here. This is very close to the fovea. So this is not one tumor where we would like to take it down with any of the laser modality. So what we had done was we had given her an injection of avastin because you can see the macular edema also 
in this particular patient and this is the FFA picture which is seen and the octa which shows the drainage, uh, drainage uh, uh, venule and the feeding arteries as well. So now what we have done for this patient is she received 11 shots of Avastin and over a period of 13 months and you can see her uh, vascularity coming down and this is what she has currently. So this is this uh, gentleman who did well with these injections. Now here is another patient. All the cases what you see may not be what we try to think it would be. So here is a 15 year old female who is again a one hipper lindo with 6 by 60 vision who also had a peripheral angioma which we treated with cryo and avastin and to the surprise three weeks later she came with a retinal detachment for which we had to do vitrectomy and settle the whole thing. So it goes without saying that every modality of treatment has its own flips plus and minuses. So the anti-VEGF to summarize in retinal capillary hemangioma, the efficacy of anti-angiogenic agents in VHL is less than complete. Anti-VEGF therapy reduces the vascular permeability by altering the balance of the vasoactive cytokines. And there is a very great variability in the response of anti-VEGF treatment. Combination treatment anti-VEGF should be done 5 to 6 days if we are doing a treatment with PDT so that we will be able to alter the pathophysiological alterations. Now moving on to the circumscribed choroidal hemangioma. This is a congenital vascular hematoma, capillary cavernous or mixed other types. And to remember, these are non-proliferative lesions. So this is not a proliferative retinopathy. Why do we get enlargement of hemangioma? It's because of the venous congestion. And the cause of vision loss is what we are trying to treat, not the thickness of the tumor itself. The serous retinal detachment in 81% and the cystoid macular edema in 17%. So asymptomatic lesions, we would always observe. The symptomatic ones, you have multimodal treatment, whichever you think would be ideal for the patient, would be least toxic, we would do it. If we do not treat, what happens is patient ends up having a neovascular glaucoma if you have a progression of the subretinal fluid. So now here is a 42-year-old male who comes with metamorphopsia, status post laser for the choroidal hemangioma. You can all appreciate the laser marks over here. He comes with a 6 to L N10 vision. So what we did is we treated him with uh, the uh, anti-VEGF treatment for him there. So that is what we have used is Avastin. And then you can see in a one month time, the, the fluid has come down. So here it's the macular edema which has come down because the lesion, if you can see, is already treated partially. So this is a patient who did well and he came back with six by six and six vision still currently under follow. So we have this gentleman to be followed for two years right now still doing well. So now the role of anti-VEGF in a circumscribed choroidal hemangioma is if you have a thin hemangioma, intravitreal anti-VEGF may be considered as a treatment modality. If you have a very thick hemangioma, a combination therapy, of course, an anti-VEGF followed by PDT to decrease the risk of PDT-associated complication itself. So now coming on into the retinal vascular proliferative tumors. So these are glial vascular proliferations. They should be differentiated from capillary hemangioma. You have primary and the secondary. Secondary can be post-inflammatory, vascular, traumatic, dystrophic or degenerative ocular diseases. So the natural history of the disease is neovascularization, the leakage of exudates and the fractional retinal detachment. So the reduction in visual acuity is again macular edema or the epiretinal membrane prolifer proliferations. So the VPT can secrete the factors enhancing the fibrous constructive, sorry, contractive tissues without cellular reactions. So that is what is important here. So here is a patient who was referred to us for management of a refractory uh, CME, which was uh, being uh, treated with Nevenac elsewhere. So then when we saw the fundus, she had a peripheral uh, VPT, what we saw. So over a period of two years, what we had done is we had treated her with uh, ranibizumab three shots and a PDT of two rounds when she came back to a vision of six by nine. So these were all cases treated uh, more than three, four years back. So that's why you see the peripheral thing so that uh, you cannot appreciate it so well. And here is another patient with Rani Bizumab who received almost 5 and then with TTT she did well. So what is the uh, anti-VGF take in uh, the vasoproliferative tumors? Intravitreal anti-VGF monotherapy has very limited effectiveness in causing long-term regression of the lesions. A small tumor which is less than 2 disc diameter can regress with one or few intravitreal anti-VGF injections. A larger tumors needs a combination treatment, probably will require additional laser or cryo or PDT. So this comes uh, to the end of this talk. Thank you.
thank you man for uh, elaborating the use of anti vegf in cases of vascular tumors so the point of discussion is uh, anti vegf is an adjuvant as we could see in most of the times we had to either add on to laser cryo or brachy so the question goes to the lg sir that when you would want to treat with what if the means whether what cases laser would be a better option versus cryo or any other option for brachy like a, a vhl lesions or a, a capillary mangioma lesions what we see the first thing we should understand is that vgf is liberated by most of those tumors but not necessarily the cause of the tumors in other words vgf doesn't produce the tumor but the tumor produces vgf and it has a lot of secondary effects yes i did see that you were shrunk a little bit with anti vgf but that is that doesn't always mean that uh, you can just treat with anti vgf and expect all the tumors to go away it doesn't happen you have to destroy them with some um, destructive measure and the type of destructive measure used depending upon what is easiest to apply in a given situation all tumors you obviously try to do with laser and the large tumor probably is easier to freeze and attach with cryo rather than with laser sometimes the surface gets treated but the the core tumor may not get treated if it's a hemangioma probably you do only pdt rather than direct laser i think it would depend upon what kind of situation you are looking at and brachytherapy is always available when these are not effective or is a little larger than that and you use a block therapy but i think it's a question of deciding on a given eye it's not a standard answer that it's not a norm here so i would like to add a point that most of these dictating things are itself the thickness so that is what the height of the dictate. tumor what yes, you suggest that is what will decide what mode of therapy you would want and the location and the yeah. sr yes and the other things yeah. which so you want to add so i just wanted to ask okay so i wanted to ask mps sir that whether there would be some more adjuvants you would want to use in these cases and what would be that kind of cases like my question is indirectly meaning either a buckle okay. or a vitrectomy or because if if those kind if we are sending in word to the audience what would be the cause of caution of not on uh, retinal angioma is treated easily with laser biopsy particularly the vitreous form which is treated up in the vitreous cap so those are difficult to treat with laser so if you want to do laser use a green laser which is absorbed by the hemoglobin in the tumor and if it is peripherally situated there is already some amount of biotation which is likely to contract and i probably place a buckle to support it to decrease the risk of uh, trd becoming a retinal and other than that like uh, the coronary hemangioma sometimes you can use icg aided uh, pdt considering that pdt is currently not available uh, uh, can i can i comment please yes 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 First of all, um, it's an excellent talk, and uh, I do agree that uh, anti vegfs are only an adjuvant. As regards to the choice of therapy, I agree that it depends on the thickness of the tumor. We don't have PDT in Egypt, so we go either for laser for small lesions or bracket therapy for larger ones for cases of retinal and capillary hemangiomas. Uh, Another addition is that. Uh, the problem is when you have a retinal capillary hemangioma on the optic disc, this cannot be treated by any means, except that last year a medication has came into the market, which is better to fan, and it was originally developed to treat renal angiomas, cases of one hip, and they noticed that all lesions in the eye had disappeared following the use of this medication, which is taken orally. The second point is excuse me sir just to me in these just to uh, what's the medication or what's the drug sir benzotifen benzotifen okay sure sir benzotifen it's an anti hypoxia inducible factor 2 so it's very specific developed for for hip disease and uh, the last comment is the tectomy we have seen all in conferences cases of tectomy cutting the tumor and ligating the vessels in my opinion these cases are followed by severe pbr and i wouldn't encourage this practice so i have one question Thank to you. ask the panel how often would you treat uh, these vhl patients because we tend to see them having glial proliferations very often and then causing a tractional retinal detachment so would you ever think about giving an intravitreal steroid so you take sir i have tried but like it doesn't prevent the biosis from happening only the cystoid macular edema and degenerative defect sometimes works but otherwise the dial part of it the steroid don't have present immediately 
last comment tell ji sir i was just wondering if it is optic disc tumor is it something that you cannot treat at all but because i have had a patient where there's so much of exudation involved in the macular area i had to something and i did pdt it's described in the books as well yeah. so despite the fact that you suspect a little bit of collateral damage can take place because it is sitting on the optic disc we have no choice we have to treat with pdt did respond so their vision definitely didn't improve as much as you would like to macula at least became dry and vision got stabilized i have uh, three patients whom i have treated sir rch the thing is like we had given anti vgf it did come down and what we had also done is a limited pdt in them so the whole thing we will not be able to get it down but there will be a little remnant tumor but depending whether you have an endophytic exophytic or a sessile pattern you can probably think about resecting also that is also being done but i have personally not man can i just request that we go on to the next talk <laughs> okay so the uh, the next is a free paper uh, by dr kushal agarwal uh, ultra low dose boom boom therapy for fine needle aspiration biopsy proven primary choroidal lymphoma um uh, this study was done at the welsai hospital philadelphia so this was a uh the purpose of the study was to study effect of ultra low dose radiation which is also known as boom boom radiation uh on an all uh, and all the patient were treated with the four gray of radiation with fnmb proven diagnosis of primary ugal lymphoma so currently standard treatment for choroidal lymphoma uh, primary choroidal lymphoma is to treat with the around 30 gray of radiation so uh, we tried uh, this four gray of radiation in patient with the choroidal lymphoma and compared with the other previous studies this was the retrospective interventional case series eight eyes of eight consecutive patients were included but patient associated with systemic lymphoma already treated with external beam radiation systemic immunotherapy chemotherapy or inconclusive fine needle aspiration biopsy were excluded from this study uh, all the patient with presumed diagnosis of primary choroidal lymphoma were further confirmed on cytology with transvitreal fine needle aspiration biopsy using 27 gauge needle all patient with cytology proven primary ugal lymphoma were treated with ultra low dose radiation therapy of 4 gray 2 gray for 2 consecutive days this is one uh, case uh, of choroidal lymphoma uh, on the left side this is the before radiation patient presented with the metamorphopsy and decrease in the vision this was 50 years old a uh, year old patient presented with around 6 6 6 by 18 vision there was diffuse choroidal infiltration and choroidal thickening uh, were seen and uh, uh, there are diffuse uh, orange mass was seen on the posterior pole area uh, this is the oct above oct is before radiation we can see classic undulating choroidal surface which is very classic in patient with the choroidal lymphoma and diffuse infiltration of the choroid we cannot see scleral shadow in the above oct this was the ultrasound in which diffuse choroidal thickening was seen choroidal thickness was around 2.6 mm on ultrasound so this patient underwent fine needle aspiration biopsy in the area of maximum choroidal infiltration and after confirmation of the diagnosis patient was treated with the ultra low dose radiation of 4 gray this is the 5 months after uh, uh radiation and we can see the on the right side uh, that the regression of the choroidal lesions are appreciated on oct also the surface of the retina has become regular and the choroidal thickness has reduced and we can see the scleral shadow ultrasound also showed resolution of the lesion so eight patient had mean age of 66 years only choroidal involvement was present in four patients choroid plus ciliary body in three patients and choroid ciliary body plus conjunctiva in one patient oct showed choroidal infiltration with classical undulating surface in all patients and fnmb confirmed diagnosis in all patient mean follow up was 32 months best corrected visual acuity improved from 20 by 50 to 20 by 30 with p value of 0.02 ultrasound choroidal thickness also reduced from 3.1 mm to 1.9 mm at last follow up which was of 32 months so this is this slide is regarding outcomes oct surface undulation came back to normal around in 6.9 months none of the patient had greater than three line of visual acuity loss or major radiation complications like maculopathy retinopathy papillopathy cataract etc we had one recurrence after 36 months of treatment and that patient was treated with increasing dose of radiation to 30 gray 
none of the patient develop systemic lymphoma in this slide we have compared our study with other two previously published studies koshik et al published on uh, orbital lymphoma and ganem et al published on primary choroidal lymphoma and uh, sample size was more in their studies while we have lesser sample size that was one drawback mean radiation dose was around 30 gray in previous studies we used 4 gray of radiation mean fall off was comparable but in another two previous two studies patient develop more percentage of patient develop cataract and radiation retinopathy like complication while none of our patient develop this complication vision deterioration in ganem et al reported 24% of the patient had vision loss post radiation and they concluded chorioretinal atrophy could be the major cause post radiation for vision deterioration but in our study we had higher recurrence of around 12.5% as compared to other studies so in our study we had higher recurrence but less uh, complication so to conclude ultra low dose radiation using 4 gray can be considered as a first line of treatment with less side effects in patient with primary uveal lymphoma the recurrence post ultra low dose radiation with 4 gray can be managed with in increasing dose of radiation to 24 to 36 gray or systemic therapy thank you thank you dr kushal so the any any points of discussion from the panelist of uh, use of low boom boom radiation so you want to come in it's uh, conventionally used for orbital lymphoma malt lymphoma and the only problem that we are facing is it has a higher chance of recurrence about one third of patients recur in 3 to 5 years Okay. So those are selected out for a higher dose of radiation, obviously. So I think that you're seeing the same trend in coronary lymphoma as well. So, sir, what is your primary management in orbital, primary orbital lymphoma? Like what? what you primary treat? orbital lymphoma, obviously, we do an incisional biopsy, confirm the diagnosis, do a systemic evaluation. If the patient just has it confined to the orbit, there is no lesion anywhere else, then low dose radiation. If the patient has systemic manifestations, then rituximab based chemotherapy. In low dose radiation means how much you use four gray only? Or no, I'm I'm actually currently trying out uh, boom boom radiation that because that is considered one of the you know standards of care now at least in the West going low on the radiation to reduce side effects. Okay, thank you. So thank you, sir. And uh, I would ask Dr. Sabina to take on the podium on the other side. Dr. Hani, do you want to comment or LG sir, Mahesh sir, or Sugneshri madam on this? It's, it's a very interesting. I mean, the modality of treatment with low complications. What I may suggest, I mean, for the author, why not to repeat this low dose radiation even for cases that have not recurred after six months or a year, and then see if the recurrence rate would go. Yes, sir, definitely could be tried in long term uh, study. Repeat, boom, boom. Boom boom and boom boom. Yes, thanks. Sir. Okay, Thank so you. Dr. Sabina uh, Sabia Ahanda. So the uh, topic of presentation is uh, submacular hemorrhage displacement using subretinal TPA and air versus subretinal BSS solution and air. A comparative study, please. Very good evening to everyone. Uh, so this is the title of my paper, and I would especially like to thank my teachers, Dr. Mohit. and professor ramdeep singh for helping me in carrying out the study so subacular hemorrhage as we all know can occur secondary to wet rmd tcb myopic cnb or retinal artery macrolysis and the natural history and visual outcome of subacular hemorrhage is typically poor and it carries a grave visual prognosis and early displacement from the macular area is recommended in order to restore useful vision and various techniques have been described for the management of large subacular hemorrhages Ranging from surgical evacuation, intravitreal gas TPA to partial nephrectomy with subretinal TPA. However, at the time of planning the study, there is no consensus or treatment guidelines regarding the optimal uh, optimal management. So the aim of our study was to study the role of subretinal balance salt solution as a substitute to TPA in the management of large submacular hemorrhages. So uh, the primary objective of the study was displacement of hemorrhage at one and three months from the baseline. And for the purpose of study, the fundus was divided into four zones, as we can see here. And the secondary objective was change in BCBA from baseline within each group and between two groups at three months. So the complete success was defined when there was displacement of bleed both from zone one as well as zone two. So the inclusion criteria included the subacute hemorrhages secondary to various etiologies and with size at least four diameter, with height at least two fifty micron. 
and the duration of hemorrhage was taken to be less than 14 days. So this was an ambispective non-randomized intervention study and our patients were divided into two groups. Group A, uh, the patients underwent 25 gauge PPV with induction of PVD followed by injection of 0.3 to 0.4 ml of PPA and 0.2 ml of air with partial fluid air exchange, 20% sepsis and heads up positioning. And in group B, the entire procedure remained the same. The only change was that instead of sub retinal PPA, a sub retinal BSS was used. So these were the results. The 10 lines were included in group A, that is TPA group, and 10 and 11 lines in group B, that is the BSS group. And the most common cause of hemorrhage was PCV followed by neovascular AMD. And the average size of submacular hemorrhage in our study was six, uh, six disc diameter. So the majority of eyes both in group A and group B had the extent of hemorrhage in zone 1, 2 and 3. That is, they were extending beyond the arcades up till the equator. So, this was the primary objective. Complete success, that is, the hemorrhage could be uh, displaced from zone 1 and 2 in 9 out of 10 eyes in group A and 9 out of 11 eyes in group B. And the, uh, there was significant improvement in visual acuity in both the groups, both at 1 and 3 months. And the improvement in visual acuity was comparable between both the groups. So coming to uh, one case example of group A in which subretinal TPA was used, this was 65 years female with PCV and we can see that there is a displacement of bleed from the macular area. And one case example from the BSS group, here we can see that this is a male uh, who had a retinal artery macronism and there was displacement of bleed from the macular area and the visual acuity improved significantly. So to conclude, past pain of vitrectomy with injection of subretinal balance wall solution and air followed by fluid air exchange and SF6 is effective in displacing large submacular bleeds in eyes presenting within two weeks and is comparable to TPA. The strength of our study was that we could quantify the extent of submacular hemorrhage by dividing into zones. However, this was a retrospective non-randomized study with a small sample. So, uh, thank you, Dr. Sabia. Very nice presentation. And uh, so, any any comments by the panelists, uh, Dr. Hamza, whether you want to comment? Uh, well, it's very interesting. I mean, to because many of my colleagues were using also subretinal BSS, and they were reporting that it is effective. But this is the first study to show that it is equally effective to the PDA. My concern I actually is not about the solution, it's about the subretinal air. I stopped putting subretinal air in these cases, and I had some complications uh, in some of the cases with macular holes and so on, and I didn't find the difference as well. But very nice presentation, in fact. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, instead of PPA, has anybody tried streptopanase or because that is It's much cheaper, that's it? So, uh, so the mechanism of action is different uh, in TPA versus streptokinase. Streptokinase we have utilized for lysing the uh, vitreous that is inducing the PVD uh, and using plasmin, activated plasmin from the streptokinase and then utilizing it. But the TPA works on breaking the bonds of the clot and that's how uh, the mechanism of action is. It's completely different from the streptokinase and urokinase. So not directly but yeah, indirectly. In, in cases of the uh, uh, strokes, they are using it, but in, in the eye, uh, the studies have shown that TPA works better than streptokinase and urokinase. Yes, obviously, the cost is one of the concerns. Being in a hospital, like in big institute, you already have a cardio uh, uh, unit where you can easily uh, uh, take a vial and then utilize it. Otherwise, it is active for 24 hours and the basic, uh, the minimum uh, 10 milligrams vial is also available, which is around 16 to 18,000 means in Bangalore, that's what the cost is. Otherwise, the 20 milligram is also there, which is 18. So 18 or 18.5 something. So it's not very high, but yes, if we discuss with the patient, we would be able to get it. Yeah, so the in, uh, we don't use it directly. It's only the that. activated plasma. The dosage was a concern. I think Pradeep, we had a discussion about uh, whether he wanted to know whether we can use it. I think you have done some research yes, on sir, like, uh, research and literature. Like I just want to make a point, there has been like uh, experimental studies evaluating uh, uh, clot lysis uh, 
by streptokinase and they have shown like uh, it do work well and the penetration into the subretinal space has been documented to be reasonably good but ERG has shown some amount of uh, toxicity at a higher uh, uh, dosage but whatever we have used till now for vitrolysis is actually um, less like uh, whatever we have used is almost uh, uh, quite lesser than whatever is described for uh, the described to cause any damage and whatever they have shown is the sufficient to clot lysis that is something which is more than that is actually we are using for vitrolysis so there i so still think that the, utilizing only the activated plasmin so, so not the direct streptokinase so we will inject streptokinase whatever it is finally streptokinase is injected into the eye and that and even lesser concentration than that has been shown to lice clot in the vitreous cavity okay so any more comments sir thanks for the, the dose of subretinal tpa injected in your study is rather high as it comes to 0.1 ml having 12.5 micrograms into 0 0.3 which is into three times almost coming to 40 micrograms we intravitreally originally we were given 50 micrograms but we cut it down to 25 micrograms because 50 micrograms also has been causing a change of retinal necrosis subretinally tpa is only five to eight micrograms dosage we're not supposed to cross beyond that just to the authors that what is the uh, rationale behind using saline versus air is that the control of injection or is that the complete they have not used TPA in one group, they used TPA in one group, and found it not likes to be the same. A, subretinal air versus. No, 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 no. They have used TPA with air in one group, no TPA, only saline in one group, and okay. found that it's equivalent. Okay. So, so the advantage is you don't use TPA at all, you don't use TPA. Okay. okay, okay, okay. Sure. Thank you. Okay, so we uh, end the session with uh, 10 minutes of delay. <laughs> so, a little uh, boil down to. Uh, the keynote talk by uh, Dr. Santosha that how to differentiate vitreous seeds and uh, diffuse infiltrating retinoblastoma which can present as anterior uh, AC seeds and management would be different. Exudative detachment in cases of uh, Coates disease versus uh, retinoblastoma as was suggested the Coates disease would have more xanthochromia kind of an appearance and would have more dilated and tortuous vessels and the blood vessels would go over it and not dip inside if we see the dip that is uh, a ret retinoblastoma and uh, other presentation was by Dr. Mohit which was utilizing uh, pigmented lesions how to differentiate chirpy, chirp and melanocytoma so a lot of different uh, distinct discussion happened on how, in what cases surgery would be indicated so the ideal cases would be peripapillary and extra mac extra foveal which would have a better visual prognosis but otherwise if it's a, a hematoma, the chance of visual improvement is lesser. The next presentation was by Dr. Kalpita, which was CAR, MAR, Dilemma and Diagnosis. So it's the CAR and MAR is diagnosis of exclusion where the CAR and MAR has to be uh, ruled out and the first primary diagnosis would be either AIR, that is autoimmune retinopathy and uh, systemic uh, uh, malignancies to be ruled out either by a, a oncologist uh, physical examination or by getting a uh, PET scan. Uh, the next presentation was by uh, Dr. Vishal, the great masquerader lymphoma. Yes, lymphoma is a very uh, great masquerader. So it can be cases of non-responsive non -responsive uveitis, either anterior, posterior, or you can have uh, just thickened uh, choroid where it may be only the choroidal involvement or a vitreous involvement where you may have uh, waxing and waning kind of a presentation. The treatment was discussed that diagnostic biopsies are important to confirm the diagnosis and most important how to take the di uh, di uh, 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 the sample by having a lesser cut rate and uh, very important to how to fix either we were we were discussing using alcohol which is not ideal but the ideal would be in saline or either the media which is presently not very easily available in India uh, the diagnosis and the further treatment was utilizing intravitreal chemotherapy or has been discussed that there can be boom boom radiation or there can be double boom boom uh, the next discussion was if i have invaded an eye with a tumor what to do if it's a retinoblastoma then ideally counsel the patient and then start the further treatment like uh, uh, chemotherapy and external beam radiation with enucleation or excentration depending how extensive the uh, spread is in cases of melanoma as was discussed that uh, if you are doing a surgery of a case of a melanoma ideally is to uh, 
do a drainage or non drainage or put in oil and then assess further and then take a call what has to be done uh, but as you were seeing that not everyone is very comfortable of using a vitrector to remove all the melanoma which is an endo resection but yes uh, it is right now in vogue uh, the next presentation was by sugneshwari madam which was about vascular tumors in anti vegf so anti vegf is a supporting therapy but yes depending upon what kind of vascular tumor is it may require further management like either laser or uh, 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 or brachytherapy or uh, pdt or cryo if it is in periphery and in certain cases where you see that there is some fibrosis or scarring in those cases we may need to add the supportive buckle element or do a vitrectomy thank you thank you yeah the, thank you dr hani for uh, uh, attending us virtually and uh, obviously you. we would meet uh, in person next time hopefully thank you thank again thank you so much thank you bye bye thank, thank you, you.